Good afternoon, everybody. I want to thank you again for joining us here at our um, town hall. This is the second one uh, with Dr. Brina Holmes uh, this month. Oh, last month. We're really glad to um, be able to have such great connection with um, Dr. Brina Holmes and Sharon Lee Treffrey, our state school nurse consultant, to get the information that we as school nurses need to um, do our jobs and we're really grateful that you're here. Thank you for the questions that you've been posing for us to uh, bring to Dr. Holmes. And if you have questions today, feel free to put them into the chat box. Um, and we'll see how far we get with the questions that we're going to continue with those that were not answered last week, as well as additional ones that have come in and we have quite a few, so. Rena, we are going to turn it over to you. Thank you again for being here. Thank you so. Always happy to be here. Always happy to end my day with you. I guess sort of end. I'm sure you feel that way too. I wanted to start today by just, uh, I have to do this with myself, but just put my shoulders back and take a deep breath. There's a lot going on in our world this week. And I wanted to acknowledge it that uh, a lot of uncertainty, a lot of refreshing of the browser to see if we have any more information about our election. Uh, we have more cases. Those of you in the Chittenden region, you know, we've lost all internet connectivity in our UVM health network. We had a cyber attack. Uh, the pediatricians at University of Pediatrics today did not have a schedule. So people just walked in and they had to say, I'm your 10 o'clock. So it's just uh, the, the absolute gift of Vermont is that we care about each other, we're gentle with each other, and we know that uh, the, the success of our work is collaboration. And so start there with gratitude. I also wanted to start with um, information sharing. So uh, there's ongoing question and, and a lot of energy that a medical home knows a result on a patient, a student or a teacher, and school nurses would really benefit from knowing that. Uh, and I've heard that it's not going great and that you're not being pulled into the team and that you're uh, finding out through the regular pathways several days hence or uh, so, I can't really make, so what we're hearing, and then on the doctor side, we're hearing that they're not always um, seeing people in person where they can get a release sign that they can share information with you because they're still doing some telemedicine and also they're often just sharing results over the phone. So I wanted to acknowledge that getting permission signed to speak to medical homes about students is still a top priority. I'm sure you work on that every day for the list of students who don't have that form. I also wanted to acknowledge that uh, the disposition form that we made as a draft that you could use in communities is a great tool, but it only works if you're in person with families because they can't sign it re remotely. And that there are difficulties in information sharing when you don't have permission signed. So all I can really say as a system person or a state person is, try to get back to some sort of team and try to get out. Don't try to do it at the case base, but try to get systems in place where how are you going to communicate with medical homes? And uh, so people have asked if you can get verbal permission to share. And, you know, once you start asking lawyers questions about sharing information, you're going to come up against a lot of um, guardrails as it should be for privacy. So I just want, but uh, if you're in a team and you're part of the medical home in terms of the care of um, your shared patients, I, I think there are uh, different protections. So I wanted to lead with that. I'm always hope, happy to, to hear from you if you're having challenges with my pediatric colleagues, because I know you are. And then the second thing I led my day, I started my day at eight o'clock with the music teachers uh, and the secretary of education and Elisa. And we, uh, we just wanted to acknowledge that we think music's amazing and important and uh, we are not, our task force did not overvalue athletics. 
we put forth guidance in our strong and healthy task force about music education. And then this second revision, we tried to add a little bit more back in with the science that you could sing in a room alone or play a woodwind or brass alone. It's not enough for the music teachers because they love music and they want more and more opportunities. They also acknowledge that they want it to be safe, but it's kind of separate than that really interesting other force field in our society about sports. So the winter sports guidance is not Soph and Brina's task force. So it just is. Uh, I don't really want to get too political about it, but there are forces. So that said, we have agreed with Bill and Ben, the two infectious disease doctors, to review the music teacher's grids about their interpretation of science, what they think might be safe, and also to look at Connecticut's plan, which apparently was cleared by some Yale medical folks, to keep moving forward with the idea that we want kids to have music education. So I, a lot of you have advocated for this beautifully. I loved that. I, when I would see the end of the email that it was a school nurse, I thought, now that's cool that school nurses are kind of amplifying the voice of music teachers. So thanks for that. I also made a few mistakes last week, which thank goodness I have the slide and tell you every time we meet that I uh, often misspeak. Well, hopefully not often. Uh, and Clayton does a nice job bringing your questions forth and then we correct the information. I also have Sharon Lee Treffy with me today, who's actually much more knowledgeable in some of the details and uh, really could have corrected the mistakes last week, what was being respectful of my rambling. So last week's uh, concern was that I was speaking about the use of wipes with children and the uh, guidance is clear, you shouldn't use wipes. It talked about like diaper wipes for, you know, that those are safe for the environmental health needs of children, but they're not good for COVID prevention. So we're sticking with uh, adults do the cleaning with the exception of soap and water. Okay, I'm ready to roll. Here we go, Clayton. Sticking right back up, I think. So let me close down my your faces so I can. Uh, all staff and students of, are required to wear facial coverings in the building. They must also wear them outside if adequate distancing can't be maintained. If a person's in a room with a door that can be closed, such as an office, can they be alone without a mask? We have a protocol here. You must knock before entering. Okay, we talked about this last week, uh, but I'm going to tell you again that we want the guidance to state always mask in the building. And that's because we don't want uh, any opportunity for misinterpretation of, of that you need a mask when you're in the building. So that's the official sentence, official uh, answer. However, this scenario where you actually have a protection in place that you will not be randomly uh, entered, you know, bombarded. Uh, again, this is your own journey with your mask. Uh, you need breaks. You can take them outside. You can take them in your vehicle. It may be that you can find a space like this with a closed door. So this is a common sense answer, but the guidance is clear. You, you have to be masked in the building. What about removing a mask in an office area where there's plexiglass? Uh, no, just no, no, no removal of masks uh, unless you're absolutely alone and, and can create that space. Next slide. Younger students pre-K through six should remain in the same cohort and yet older students mix for education purposes. Can you explain why you're saying that? So I really appreciated this question today. It came through on email that um, this might be one of the remnants of a 41 page document that's gone through two revisions because early on we talked a lot about pods and cohorting and we still like it because it produces more simplicity and contact tracing. That said, we've learned a lot in the last seven, eight months. And when high school kids are exposed to the virus or have the virus, it's really not that many people that are identified as close contacts, even though they move about. So we're not that hung up on pod cohort or not. So that's kind of a non-answer, uh, except to say that the clause at the end, is it allowable to combine classes due to staffing issues? If good seating charts, absolutely. Uh, increased number of staff out daily for symptoms and testing. I, that is so important to state out loud. That is true. And we'll be in a position to not have kids in days on, 
in person on days if we don't combine classes. So this is a great uh, example of where we need uh, to bring our guidance along for the current environment. This is exactly what I want to hear from you all because this is allowable. So what, and you've heard me talk about this. We have elementary school kids who are potted, but then at three o'clock they enter into an after school experience. It's a different group. We even have some kids that then that have a, a third pod that they engage with on their remote days, if those still exist. So pods and cohorts have some value, but they're not uh, absolute. And we are clearly seeing in Vermont that if all the other mitigation is in place, the mixing of students is not a high risk activity. Next slide. Testing timeline of a child confirmed as a close contact of a positive case when, when they develop symptoms but test negative prior to day seven and the need for him to stay in quarantine. Okay. I think this is, oops, thanks, Clayton. I've got to go back to that one because it's complicated. Oh, what's happening? Are you giving my answer? Oh, oh yes. Yeah, so yeah but this came up by what? They kind of went together, but it wouldn't fit on one slide. So um, that was the question. And then your statement was on the second page, and they were asking if you could kind of clarify your statement from the V chip on the second. Great. So this is really important. What we're noted, we're hearing from contact tracing that uh, obviously with the first time you speak to a close contact, the advice is quarantine and be tested day seven, because at that point, almost always a close contact is asymptomatic. So that's just the general advice for people that don't have symptoms that have been exposed to the virus, wait till day seven, get a test. But the problem is, according to my contact tracers and some epi staff, kids, some kids are developing symptoms day two of quarantine, day one of quarantine, day three of quarantine, and that it's messing up with our process if they wait till day seven. Because if they end up positive, they're now, they had symptomatic exposure to others, potentially others back in the school because they were only a day or two out of school when they developed symptoms. So this is a yes and. If, you, if you're home quarantining and you develop symptoms, you go get the test then, not day seven. Does that help? I, hope, I can't tell because I don't know who asked. Okay, next slide. If a student's been waiting 10 days and no longer has symptoms, can they return to school prior to receiving a negative result since they would be returning if they had a positive result according to the algorithm? Yes. But this is, so this relates to what I said about UVM cyber attack. It, it is un, unmanageable for me that someone's waiting 10 days for a test result. So if that's happening, I need to know because it, we had a few cases early on because the cyber attack affected a group of test specimens like a week ago today, last Thursday is when it broke. And those specimens got a little screwed up in when they were sent. And so we did hear that it was six or seven days to get results, but that shouldn't be happening anymore. So if the, if the person who put forth the scenario is willing to write to me directly, I, I just, this can't be a thing. So we cannot have that be true because that would defeat the whole purpose of testing. Next slide. Are there any plans to impose quarantine requirements for travel within Vermont with rising cases and some of our counties being the equivalent of red or yellow in surrounding states? Uh, no current plans, but completely acknowledge this is true. What Vermont says about its uh, red and yellow counties is interesting to me, perhaps you. Perhaps because we know so much about our cases, we know a county goes red uh, because of a, a certain situation or small outbreak and then we know when it's resolved so it feels a little bit better to our leadership that that's a understandable situation as opposed to other states experience where they're just red and we don't know where the virus is and we don't know if it's community spread and we don't know how rampant it is so that's my only kind of justification of the current approach that we're not containing vermonters to counties for travel next slide If a student spits on someone intentionally, can they be required to be COVID tested? Wow. I, 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 um, 
looking to Sharon Lee here, I'm going to say yes, because this fits into communicable disease. This is like sexual, you know, my adolescent health background is helpful here, which is um, adolescent health would say, you know, in a uh, communicable disease sexually transmitted, there is some legal protection around that, especially HIV, if you have a needle stick. Or needle so sticks. I can't see the chat, but if yeah, yeah. needle sticks. I but on this one, I think we I should go back to Epi or discuss it offline. I don't feel like I can yeah. respond to the actual okay. spit situation. Yeah. <laughs> Let's table this one. This one that's quite a question. Remember, I said last week. I'm just going to say again because it might be a new group of you or like your questions are really extraordinary. They're super helpful in our journey. So th so keep them coming. Next question. Will Vermont ever differentiate between case rate counts in Vermont counties when limiting travel? So right now Grafton count, New Hampshire has a lower rate Oak County than Washington County, yet we can't travel New Hampshire. So I think I just answered that. Uh, so the current policy in Vermont is not to define our case rate by county for quarantining. That could change, however. Next slide. If schools go fully remote over the holidays, would that include daycare or just schools? Staff are worried they will not have access to childcare and be trying to teach students remotely while caring for their own children. There's there've been absolutely no conversation about childcare changing its in-person experience for Vermont kids. Truly no conversation. And it just, it's an important thing for me to say out loud because so many of you have young children, but you also have pre-K and you know a lot about this field. Our child care providers have exhibited extraordinary courage and leadership since March. And they don't uh, have intentions to, to not care for kids. So I think they feel uh, heartened by the experience of having the kids back with them. And they also have really strong partnerships with us at the health department when there are cases. And it's a pretty rare event, as you may recall. You know, we would hear about a child care now and then, and it's been really rare this fall to have cases in child care. Next slide. Are there any plans to utilize the anterior swabs for COVID testing in children more widely? The nasopharyngeal test is traumatizing. So 100% yes. Uh, we almost always do anterior nares in children. Uh, I'm curious if this person had a personal experience and it may be that you went to a site that didn't do the anterior nares, but our pop-up sites are the only place I know that still only do nasal pharyngeal, but pediatric offices and uh, pharmacists, uh, hospital settings are doing anterior nares and, it, um, and our college settings are all front of the nose. And the supply chain for this is adequate. The part you'll find interesting, I think, as clinicians, if a, a child can self-administer the test and not, the, and then the provider doesn't have to wear full PPE. And the pediatric community has been debating for weeks, what age do we think a kid, when witness, you know, you, you stand in front of them, uh, what age do we think a child can adequately do his own nostrils? And so a lot of the pediatricians with kids are testing it out on their own children. We think it's about age five, to, as long as you're standing in front of them and tell them to hold it in there for 10 seconds. Next slide. If students are staying outside or space six feet apart, do they need to wear facial covering? No, but, but really be careful about that six feet. Next slide. How do we handle kids eating at round tables? They'll be facing each other. Most of our tables are round. So uh, if this is a little kid question, they should be three feet apart and the round tables have to accommodate that. So you'd need a tape measure. And 16 to 20 kids could sit in a circle outside for three feet, definitely. So it's just really about the, the three feet is, you know, the research that we have on that is about <clears throat> three feet from one person's 
mouth or nose to another person's mouth or nose. So round tables are okay if they're circumference. Is that the right term? Diameter. Their diameter is long enough. Next slide. Regarding students who tell the school nurse that they had symptoms at school, but then tell their parent, then their parent tell the pediatrician the student never had them. Oh gosh. My concern is half these students really must have been fibbing, but th there are some parents who are pushing to get their kids to school. So this is great. I, I feel like we talk about this every week and it gives us an opportunity to just pause in our belief in a strength-based approach to our hard, hard work with families. So uh, the kid, you know, this scenario is predicated on you being uh, in the clinical situation of witnessing the symptom. So that's the, that child does not return to school because you sent them home with symptoms and their return path would would require an alternative diagnosis, a resolution of the symptom or the test, as you know, from the algorithm. So I think this gets us back to some sort of trusted clarity between you and the pediatric community in your town, because this, this question implies that a pediatrician is sort of overruling your um, observation that, or your clinical diagnosis that a child had a symptom. But all so important. I just was this afternoon speaking with home-based childcare providers who were describing similar scenarios. That they, because their comfort is in the center, because they don't have school nurses, and they would send kids home with symptoms, and they would be back the next day with sort of pediatric clearance. So I get that this isn't as perfect as we designed it in our heads. How about that? Next slide. If your child's daycare is in red or yellow, is this considered essential travel? Daycare provider. So I think this question means that your um, child care provider is outside of Vermont. And if that's true, I need Sharon Lee. Because that's a, that's a pretty rare but important scenario. Well, it's Sharon, for the- Sharon Lee, what do you think? I, yeah, that, that's essential. Um, they have to travel to get their child there. They're, um, if they have no other child care provider, that's their family's arrangement. So that's essential care. That's how we responded earlier to the similar question. Okay, thank you. Because it's a back and forth and daily then, thing. And Sharon Lee, you want, want to say something about the child that fibs, our favorite word, verb? I know, I just love that. Um, you know, sometimes, and you probably all, all do this, is you call the family and you let them know, well, this is what the child is telling me. And sometimes that works where then the child and the parent have to negotiate that, kind of takes you out of the negotiation. You're just reporting your what you observe and any relevant vital signs. Um, and re you're reporting the complaint. So I would give some more responsibility to the families to help navigate that. And why is the child reporting things that are not reported? Okay. Yeah, that's a great point. Next slide. If a parent says they are mask exempt, can they enter a preschool to drop off their child? Oh man, no. Uh, I don't. Yeah, that's not a good one. Uh, I I see the pitfall here. Uh, that needs a, a t that needs a team meeting because if that's the only parent that can drop a child and there's a true exemption. I just don't. I just don't know very many people who are mask exempt, and it's just the prevalence is, you know, shifting a bit. We have more cases. I, I just that's not a good idea. So, Sharon Lee, any thoughts on that one? 
it's going to come into the same question of now we have some teachers with mask exemptions. Um, we've been consistently saying only people wearing masks, adults wearing masks, can come into the childcare. Yeah. Okay. Whew, these are this is a level of detail that shows this is getting hard. Next slide. Dr. Holmes, before we go to the next slide, there's a question in the chat box that kind of goes along with that. And it was, how would you respond to an adult getting a medical exemption for a mask and a face shield? We have seen exemptions from um, naturopathic doctors, which include masks and face shields, even for adults. Disposition tools are working really well for this. Sorry, I asked that question. The disposition tool was in regards to the last one about oh. the fibbing of the child. <laughs> oh, phew. Hi, Dory. That, so those were two separate. Well, first of all, I'm so glad the disposition tool is working. So for those that, if that's not in your world right now, it, it, it does seem to be helping a lot. Um, an adult gets a medical exemption for a mask and a face shield, meaning they don't need a mask. They've been told they can do a face shield. They've been told that they don't, exemptions. they can't do, they can't do a face shield or a mask. And they have an exemption from a naturopathic doctor that says that. And we have several uh, are the, students are that are also teachers? getting, teachers and students are getting um, exemptions from naturopathic doctors. Okay, Dory, I'm going to say that you reach out to me separately. We need to, this might require, uh, you know, Dr. Levine and others, that, that's not a something I'm comfortable with. Cool, and thanks. Then, and then when we get the response, yeah. then we can share that out with everybody. Thank you, that'd be great. Okay, back to slides or back to chat? You know, I do love a good chat box. Slides see for now. There's a lot going on there. Okay, keep doing slides, okay. Uh, are school nurses required to report data on the annual report for fully remote students and homeschooled students? I'm going to give this one to Sharon Lee. Yeah, that's such a great question. Um, the students that are homeschooled, not enrolled in anything in school, you don't have to report on them. If they're enrolled in school or they would have been from, uh, enrolled and they're taking part of your remote academy, they're part of the report for immunizations and annual report data. Great, next slide. How about the child who reports traveling and the parents who say, no, we didn't. So this is similar to what, you know, this is sort of a, either it's a fibber or it's, uh, you know, that the child needs support to with parents and school nurses talking about this disconnect or the child is reporting the facts and uh, we have parents who are not complying with quarantine guidelines and that also requires some pretty strong leadership on your part or someone in your school to say that this is concerning and and not following public health guidance like you I should have said at the beginning but I said this last week we are absolutely going to rise or fall on this travel piece and um, we're, the press conference tomorrow is going to be entirely focused on schools and travel because we have a new uh, toolkit from the health department. I hope Sharon Lee's, I'm sure, shared with all of you really well done saying like this is uh, absolutely going to make or break the, the experience of uh, safe schools if you gather or hit the road out of compliance with our guidance. And I was on a call with the Vermont Medical Society today with Dr. Levine, and he just said, like, it's not a normal Thanksgiving, and it's not going to be a normal Christmas. It's just, and we, and, and we will look back on that with a lot of loss, but it is not the same as the loss we're going to feel if we find ourselves back in lockdown. Next slide. What's the preferred method for vision screening? This is also for Sharon Lee Snellen or Spot. I'll take that one. Right, sure, that's a great one. Um, yep, only the distance charts for near or vision, and we're not really doing near vision this year, um, but those are the recommendations. The vision screeners are great for those up to age six. 
the spot vision machine. The, those are optic readers. They don't measure um, acuity and the acuity is part of our regulated uh, requests for screening. Um, so yeah, great. So snowing, we like snowing. Next slide. For outdoor PE, can students remove masks if they're maintaining a distance six feet apart? Yeah. But we hear a lot, this was from summer camps and uh, outdoor activities, that requires an intense amount of monitoring from the adult about the distance. So it's safer to just have them keep their masks on. So that's kind of a, a yes and answer, but you know, we're, we're requiring masks through all uh, sports. So you may as well just, since we know that's safe and kids are getting used to them, they should just keep them on for PE as well. Next slide. Hand sanitizer. The guidance says hand sanitizing stations must be set up at the entrance so students can sanitize before they enter. With colder weather, students are now wearing mittens. Would it be acceptable for them to perform hand hygiene in their classroom once they remove their mittens and put their belongings away? Hmm. Uh, I have to think about that one. I, I think probably not. I think we're trying to not risk that there's activity between entrance and classroom that's not that hasn't involved hand hygiene. Sharon Lee, thoughts on that? Looking, um, I'd have to read it. Let me get back to you. I'm finishing up the other. Oh, okay, sorry. No, I think I'm good here. I don't want that, that kids walk down to their classroom having not washed their hands because then they're gonna put their belongings away and then wash their hands. So now we don't know what that exposure was. And I think we'll stick with entrance here. Right. Next slide. Oh, this is a good question. So from the, I, I assume this means for the cases we've had uh, where there, there actually was transmission. I do want to remind you, I think it's now only, two, it's two or three schools total where there was transmission in the school out of, you know, maybe 30 cases altogether. Uh, the primary lesson learned. Uh, so because it's such small numbers, I'm gonna hedge on this a little bit by not, so, uh, I, cause if I say what we, we've we kind of unroofed, it's going to be a bit stigmatizing. So I'm just gonna say that, you know, we can continue to feel very good about our guidance, about our distancing, about our mask requirements and about our um, staying home when you're sick. I, that being said, I will say something larger, which I said last week, uh, adults need to stay home when they're sick. And it is striking to me in all of our situations, not just schools, but workplaces and events, people get a scratchy throat or a little bit of symptoms going and they then they go to uh, work or events. So we probably need to double down on our messaging that if you get us if you are symptomatic in any way you stay home. I think we're you know it's this ebb and flow of what we're how to, what to keep pushing out and I think the mask piece we're doing beautifully with but this idea that when we look back a person's like oh yeah I did not feel well for three days I'm like what so but that's not a you know direct school comment, so I'll I'll leave that there. Next slide. We have so many parents that went to get an allergy diagnosis from their medical provider, and now when they have new congestion, the parents push hard saying it's allergies. Can we require them to contact for? Yeah, of course. So clinical decision making. So what's implicit in this is what was the allergic to what? <laughs> because seasonal allergies go away when it frosts. So allergic to what? If it's dust mites and, you know, uh, indoor allergens, then very reasonable that it's continuing through November. But if it's pollen, so you absolutely can build that team back again. You're the health professional in the building. 
your uh, your job is to really parse out who's sick and who has allergies, and you'd like to talk to have your families uh, ex- explain better. I mean, it, with the kids you know well, I'm sure you know what their allergen is, which would help you make this help make this clinical decision about new symptoms. Next slide. How is it safe to hold indoor sports that have no access to fresh air? Hmm. Well, I didn't. I don't think the gym that they're intending to not have the same air quality uh, recommendations that we have in the rest of the school. So if that, if you're imply, if you're feeling that your gym is not adequately ventilated, then that's a, a school building specific question. Uh, oh, but you're just wondering about fresh air. Yeah, no, I, uh, gyms are are held to the same environmental standard as the rest of the building as it relates to uh, students. Next slide. Well, maybe this was like a um, um, continuation. When students return uh, to school, oh no, no, it's just a header. Yeah. Okay, I got it. Okay, when students return to school and the parent has not followed the advice of the nurse, or the healthcare provider for the algorithm should the student be excluded. Yeah, these are so hard. I mean, the, the word exclusion is a little bit tricky for me. It, you know, that's a hard word for me in education, as you know. I, I think this. I think there needs to be a, a very significant conversation that occurs that you, you are, uh, you and your position are able to say this is not uh, appropriate to be here but I would need to know a lot more about the specific example. But in general, yes, you are uh, in the, the health uh, position to keep your school safe. So uh, a student that's ill or coming back uh, without an understanding of why she's ill or he's ill is, uh, should not be there. What do you do about a principal who does not want the nurse to make follow-up calls who are Students are absent until they've been absent for two days. In this situation, two days is the whole week. Well, so this is sort of a relational question, which is, uh, you know, the, I like to get to root cause. And so why is it because the person feels it's not a good use of your time? Uh, is it taking you away from another activity? You know, I, I need much more information, but my uh, general concept is, I absolutely love understanding why all students are absent. This precedes COVID. School absenteeism is one of my career passions uh, from my work. And it is, it's been shown that when someone in the building calls and checks in on a student who's absent, that it improves the emotional, you know, the climate of the school. So uh, I guess maybe this principal needs more information from you or someone else about the importance of uh, tracking absence in general, not just in COVID. Next slide. What should we do about providers that are not following the algorithm? We've had issues with two different providers not providing an alternative diagnosis and allowing the student to return after they feel better. So my first thought is your school liaison, your great, great uh, nurse partner, or I guess not always a nurse, but your school health person in the district office because I need these get elevated to me at times and I do make phone calls to to colleagues to say are you familiar with the algorithm and it's uh, proving to be difficult for our schools if you're not following it and to date I haven't had too many of those so that it would be prohibitive for me just in terms of my time I I'm very willing to do that for this question the person who posed this question as well I you know I just like teams and I'm sorry for the broken record. I just want you and your school liaison and your medical providers to meet and have a zoom call and say, gosh, we're heading into the, uh, the respiratory season. And I really want to get our communication clear. And this algorithm is really working that kind of thing. Next slide. What's the current guidance about college students to return home from red and yellow counties? Do parents, siblings need to quarantine? Okay, so there's been great uh, messaging about this. I can send Clayton sort of the, you know, I'm not always finding everything perfectly on the website, but um, 
when kids come back from college, they have to quarantine and your parents and siblings don't quarantine, but you have to act differently in the house. You as the parent or the sibling. So you have to mask if you're in congregate, you know, in um, shared settings and you have to keep six feet apart and no hugging and all this really hard stuff. I mean, you guys, most, you know, I've got lots of, well, now just one college student, but I've got 20 somethings coming from red zone. So uh, that Vermont, we're still grateful. We do have a day seven test option for these young people. If they're coming home for an extended period of time, you can bring them in quarantine seven days and get a test. That's not true in other states. So this is difficult, but essential. Next slide. Based on updated guidance around share materials, can students work on a project together or play together sharing toys? Yes. The key to this activity is wash your hands, do the activity, share the Legos, wash your hands again. So it's not that we're, that's the shift we're making. It's not the product, you know, or, or the material that needs the sanitization, san, the sanitizing, it's the hands. Next slide. Depending upon where children are referred to by their PCP for COVID testing, it takes 12 to 24 hours or three to five days. Many of our families or blue collar families have to stay out of work three to five days versus one to two makes a huge difference. I encourage families to plan with their extended family to help with child care. Many families don't have that kind of support. I could not agree more. This is exactly why I love working with school nurses. COVID is so, we're so focused on the virus where we need to keep elevating the social emotional health of our kids and the social determinants of health that uh, affect families in an unequal way in Vermont. So this is exactly right. Uh, I don't know, I can't fix this, but I absolutely can encourage you as that keeper of social determinants and uh, knowing your families to try again, meet with school liaisons and wonder, and this is gonna get easier. We're, we're determined to have more and more and more testing opportunities for Vermonters in the weeks and months ahead. Like truly, like I just feel like getting a test and it's simple. I went to a party, it didn't feel quite right. There were too many people, I need a test. That level of sort of what we call the worried well. So I, I would encourage each community to use district offices to think about this. Where are the testing opportunities? What's the turnaround time? And making sure that there's equitable access for exactly this reason. Now, that being said, I'm sure it's in the chat. The UVM situation is horrendous. And the turnaround time right now, these, those tests are going to Mayo and it's taking five days. And that, that has nothing to do with equity. That's just a system issue. Next slide. Okay, with regards to contact tracing exposure, what are your thoughts about mixing? Is it too soon to allow this? Um, so I think I answered that earlier, but I just want to reiterate it. That's exactly right. This is an imperfect scenario, which is uh, the mixing versus the contact tracing. So uh, right now we're saying it's okay to mix. And uh, there may come a time where I'll have to come back to you or the school guidance will have to shift that we feel that we, there are too many close contacts identified when, a, when we do have a case based on moving into different pods and cohorts. But right now with all the other mitigation strategies in place, it is, a low risk activity to share, to shift pods. Next slide. Uh, I wanna take a second to uh, just, Sharon Lee wanted to say a little bit about the success of uh, school liaisons while I, I had mentioned it a few slides back. Do you wanna unmute Sharon Lee? Thank you. Yeah, that is the, it reminded me when the nurse was talking about difficulty, um, following up on the protocols that they feel best in the, not having support with the principals. And we've had at least three, and I know, I know of others as well, liaisons who've been working with school nurses around these issues. And one of the, one of the great successes is bringing in your medical consultant, um, either on virtual 
meeting with the principal. Um, some schools do that weekly and it gives a whole new light when the medical provider there is shining their light on the school nurse and agreeing. Um, there have been lots of other team uh, work with liaisons who are working with a whole group of school nurses in their district and bringing um, that perspective in and just reminding um, you that it's okay to say, you know, I have extra experience. I have a license in healthcare and um, I can help with these. And having another voice is sometimes helpful. That's so great. We've had a lot of I mean, successes with liaisons. A lot of good, good stories from your colleagues. I think we address this. How do we best address situations about students traveling and not following quarantine? I mean, this is absolutely needs a conversation. I think, you know, it's not really a time to sort of turn to blind eye, right? And then this one, I don't really understand, but Dan French talking about our actions being linked to licensure. How do we react to that situation? It, uh, whoever had this question, I need to know more. I've never heard Dan French talk at all about licensure. And Sharon Lee, do you know anything about that? Not that one specifically, but I'm thinking of immunization laws um, and that educators, uh, leadership, principals, superintendents are responsible for their license and the license requires that they follow state law. The state law and immunizations is that the administrator is responsible for ensuring that gets done. So that is an example of how the educator has to practice their scope. So I don't know if he's drawing using, it's your licensure is to follow the rules. As yeah, I'm educator. not sure if it's linked to the question above related to travel. I, you know, I, we've talked to AOE a ton about uh, observational, you know, if you're noticing something in your school that doesn't feel right or isn't right, that what is the pathway? And they would really like to field those uh, concerns at AOE. That's not really, because we don't have any authority in public health for this, uh, that's those situations. And many of you have stepped forward and noticed some concern about distancing of children and things like that. So that, if that pathway is not clear to you, I can get you the, like the inbox, the way to do that at AOE. Next slide. And we can, I can uh, send that to you and Sharon Lee, that specific uh, email so that you have the whole email and then you can respond back to that person specifically. Yeah, we have our guidance Great. from Elisa who is really encouraging individuals to use the chain of command, share your concerns with the leadership, put it in writing in an email and you know, ask how you can work together to support it. And if that doesn't work, I'll put the email in the chat box here. Okay, non-custodial parent travel. With regard to quarantine, we understand students may visit a non-custodial parent in another state. However, is the expectation the student and the non-custodial parent will avoid non-essential activity? Yes, so this is such a, a key turn of language here. So expectation, yes. So what we've really encouraged, so first of all, this is a, you start with the principle that uh, a child should not be singled out or punished because this, he is, divorced parents or parents that live in different states and then uh someone that has a relationship with this family uh can set expectation or at least explain that the red zone is high risk for all of us and that uh, a student a child seeing his parent is the essential part but the rest of the activities are not but What's implied in this question, that really requires a relationship. You know, it's very hard to to call a, a person you don't know. And so I, I but we don't have any, um, you know, requirement here. There's no sort of piece of paper that anybody signs. This is just acknowledging that movement to a red zone is allowable in this scenario, but not the activities that would involve exposure. Next slide. Can you go through the algorithm again around one symptom and quick resolution of that versus more than one? I've written that at last week's meeting. There was something about more than one symptom. Is there something new in the guidance? It's definitely nothing new in the guidance. 
this might be a good, this person that asked this question should probably just call Sharon Lee and we can, and she can pull up the algorithm and go through it. Cause it, that's hard to do with a big group. Uh, unless Clayton wants me to do that, which I'd be happy to. I, um, there's nothing new. No, I, so, think, I think we'll forward that. I'll get that one to Sharon Lee and then we can go from there. And then if we need to revisit the algorithm, maybe we can do that at a later date. Excellent. Great. Thank you. How is the best way to fill school nurse vacancies when nurses are out due to being symptomatic? Sharon Lee, that's a really hard one. Yeah, that's There's another no relationship thing. That's like building relationship in your community. Some schools have parents who are nurses or healthcare providers. Um, sometimes it means finding somebody in the school who you can delegate to. They're not a nurse sub, but they, there might be certain tasks that can be delegated. Happy to talk with anyone about this individually um, and or with their liaison and we can talk about what that means. But yeah, it's a hard, really, really hard challenge. I've been there. Great. Okay. I'm going to give this one to Sharon Lee as well. She's been our PPE expert all along. Yeah. We are still working with that. There was a plan that you should have had access to um, KN, uh, excuse me, N95 masks that are fit tested. So that plan went to the Agency of Education. We need to get move it to the individual schools so you can develop your own respiratory protection plan and then get fit tested for the supply that's available through the state emergency operations center. Going to your local EMS or hospital and getting fit tested may not match the supply that's available through the state emergency operations center or really the national supply chain. Um, so that's in progress. The KN95s are um, stronger than a surgical mask. They offer more protection. So they are decent protection. And there's um, plans to acknowledge how that fits around the crisis shortage nationwide. So there's some more complexities coming. Dr. Holmes, I think we lost your speaker. Oh, no, I got put on mute. Thank you. Uh, so why then do we have guidelines for outdoors without masks to be six feet or more? It's inconsistent. Uh, I don't see the inconsistency. I mean, you can't eat with a mask on. So we're just allowing for that. Uh, I guess I don't really know the question. Uh, is the question why you can't be without a mask three feet apart outside? No, no, that's but my question. Um, it's Flo Kelly. Um, it's outside, we're asking kids to wear masks if they're within six feet. But yet the guidelines say for pre-K to six that if they're eating, it's okay to be three feet without a mask. So the nurses were feeling in my district that that's very inconsistent and the staff are very upset that it's okay to eat without a mask within three feet, but outside it's not okay. Yeah, so two, there are two forces at play here. I mean, eating is uh, a very brief activity and we just acknowledge that it's, it's a, it has to be mask free. So that's a small amount of time in the day where there is a, a slight risk because being without a mask is a risky venture. So then when you move outside, we don't want people unmasked because that would just add to the level of risk that now you have another 15, 20, 30, 45 minutes without a mask. So I, I hear you. I really appreciate the interpretation because it, you know, it all matters how it, ha you know, it lands on the people using the guidance. But to me, it's just, we have to eat. So I don't like eating around people 
without math. I mean, it's it, but it's a reality of COVID. You got to sit down, you got to get some food in, and then you got to get the mask back on. Whereas outside, I mean, kids are just completely, um, I mean, everybody should just be masked all the time, except for when they're eating. Just that brief eating, drinking. I hope that helps. I'm I'm really happy to clean up any language in future iterations or try to explain things better. Yeah. Want to do one more, Clayton? Now that schools can use gym for PE, can you please comment on concerns you may have if these spaces are being used for isolation spaces? Confidentiality, mixing of ill or not ill use of curtains. I don't know, Sharon Lee, what do you think about this? I mean, I think the question is, how do you set up an isolation space well, right. regardless of what space you're retrofitting? I, I think there are definitely guidelines for that. Go ahead. It all depends on how big the space is. If you've got a huge space and you're off in a corner, that's one thing. But if you're right elbow to elbow, that's an isolation. Happy to talk about that one with your you and your liaison. Yeah, that's an important. That's important. So we have one last question. Okay. You have time, Dr. Holmes. We had this one last one. If you want to just address sure. it. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And then the, we'll have to pick up the chat. There's some good stuff in the chat too. That'll have to be addressed. So what's the practice for social distancing on buses? We look at bringing more students back. Also, we have issues with compliance, keeping windows open. The bus drivers feel it's not feasible. Okay. Two things. So one, the bus guidance is rock solid. You could just put, you, put, you know, and I can't, recite it without reading it but it's um it, it the guidance talks exactly about how you should put kids on a bus and if i can't imagine a world where there's that many uh you know that where you would have to exceed what you could fit on the bus because the bus is actually pretty you can put a fair amount of kids on buses and then i lost the second question because it's back to soap's face now maybe we're trying to wrap up oh the the cold weather we also added i'm really proud of this part we added a big section that the transportation folks um crafted for us with all the national information about how to set up a bus with windows some windows open but the heat blasting and how you can create this sort of important balance between the environmental health of the bus and the and um temperature so i would just bring forth that section and um and not really get into like feasibility because it, it is feasible. The bus drivers need to keep the windows open. It's in the guidance, but they also need to put the heat on. So, okay, we'll stop there. Sabrina, <clears throat> excuse me. Thank you very much for um, sharing your time and your expertise with us um, today. I know that things are gonna get a little bit trickier and we all want answers right now, even though we've been living with the not having answers right now for eight months. Um, so appreciative of everything that you are doing and sharing with us and the amount of energy that you put into um, supporting us and working with your docs. And it, it's just been amazing. Um, Um, again, thank you. I want to let the, all the school nurses know we will not be having a town hall next week. Um, those of us on the executive committee need at least a week off. <laughs> um, continue to send your questions and your concerns uh, to the VSSNA. Um, why can I never remember that email address? I've COVID-19 at VSSNA, it's COVID-19 at VSSNA.org. I think I fumbled it every week. <laughs> okay, I gotcha. um, uh, so continue to send your questions. Um, the executive committee has been amazing about taking the answers that um, Sharon Lee and Brina give us and posting them onto our COVID response page. Because if one of us has a question, we all can use, we, we all have the question or we might think about it later. Uh, so, hey, so can I just um, acknowledge at the end? Yeah, I just wanted to acknowledge at the end there that um, 
the chat is so rich today because that someone posed a question and someone answered it for them. It's you're starting to become this like self-contained, maybe you already were, you really don't need me. And then I love that Nate and Sharon Lee, thanks so much for, you know, posting and, and cutting and pasting. Cause the more you guys have the, the information in your hands, the better we're all going to be. So uh, keep calling your school liaison, keep reaching out to us and um, I'll see you again soon. Thanks. Thanks so much. Thanks again to um, Sharon Lee and Nate and all of you for being here and go enjoy the evening. <laughs>